Hello, everyone, and welcome to day 21 of Bitwise, where we code the uh, complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So uh, last time on day 20, uh, we did uh, an overview of what I was planning on doing for packages in ION, and we started working on the implementation. I think on the mainstream, we did um, some basic, uh, you know, kind of OS specific uh, directory walk code. And then on the, uh, on the extra stream, we, we took that further and actually hooked it up to, um, to building a package by sucking in all the files in a single directory, that sort of thing. Um, later that day and yesterday, I worked uh, very hard on kind of finishing off most of what I wanted to do for packages, except for a few straggler features that are easy to add piecemeal. Um, so this was a really big change, and uh, it was really good for the compiler in general. I mean, it's it's good for end users and myself, who's going to be writing a lot of Ion code in terms of what the language feature provides. But it was also really great for the compiler because uh, it forced it forced me to make certain realizations, but it also forced me to really clean up uh, clean up the internals. And and that's still a work in progress, but it's still ma it's massively better than it was even on Monday. So. Um, Originally today, I was planning on having this be the sort of the big Risk Five kickoff, where I would do a big spiel about it. Um, because I worked so hard yesterday, I'm pretty sleep deprived, and I don't uh, really have the ability to do that. Um, so my plan for today is uh, we won't be doing any coding, and it may be a truncated stream depending on how many questions there are and how long this stuff takes to cover. But um, I plan to start off by demoing packages. Um, and talking about all the related changes in the compiler, and I think this is really important. Um, uh, to uh, first of explain the feature, but also explain um, some some things about the approach, the design we were using for resolving, um, and some fruits it had that I had not fully realized, but that became evident with the new package system. And so I want to really talk about that, so hopefully people can understand it. Um, and then once we once we're done with demoing packages, um, I will give a quick Risk Five intro, um, not really a first principles intro, but just sort of a brief intro, uh, point you to the instruction manual and then sort of use that uh, to set the stage for the coming period in terms of the work we'll be doing. And then I plan to do uh, for the next stream when we start coding on uh, a RISC-V emulator and a assembler and stuff like that, uh, I plan to talk about um, you know, the, the RISC-V instruction set in more detail in a more granular way, uh, and also to do some homework. Um, like my, my plan is to do um, to do some Maybe depending on your background, maybe it's it's rote homework, but basically uh, getting you to figure out by by hand how to translate certain C instruction sequences, like act like you're a simple compiler and translate uh, certain higher level C idioms to RISC-V instruction sequences and sort of use that as a way to get familiar without having to write full programs. Um, and uh, not, not a very inspiring approach in terms of being able to write a complete program and running it, but we'll do that too. But just getting you into the mindset if you're coming from a C background and don't have any assembly programming experience, I personally think the kind of Rosetta Stone approach of, you know, taking a snippet of C code and figuring out how to translate it is a really good place to start. Um, and so that's the plan for today. Uh, no coding, I think, um, and maybe shorter than usual because I'm very exhausted. Um, but anyway, let's uh, let's jump in and talk about packages. Um, I think I mentioned on, uh, just to recap, I don't think I have the text file anymore, um, but I think I mentioned that um, the packages had uh, kind of three parts um, uh, with three components to it. And the first one is physical, physical organization. It's, a, a you know, uh, how to organize uh, uh, source files uh, uh, into a library uh, or application. Um, uh, you know, uh, let's see here. Physical organization. The other one was dependency management, um, and I don't mean this in sort of a package manager style of I'm downloading stuff from the internet. I just mean, um, you know, expressing uh, uh, dependencies on other libraries, um, and then there's namespacing, managing. Um, names local to each package, also uh, avoiding name collisions in C code. So um, 
these were basically what I anticipated being the three big pieces of packages. And um, aside from being, a, I think, a fairly uh, accurate conceptual summary of what they provide, it was also it turned out to be a good work plan in terms of what order to tackle things in. So basically, on Monday on stream, we did uh, we did part one, uh, not not fully, but we got a good part of part one done. Uh, which by itself is already an improvement because you don't have to put everything in one file, right? Now you can have multiple files and you could uh, put all the files for a single package into a directory. And when you pointed the compiler to that directory, it would find all the .ion files and compose them in an out-of-order fashion, um, which relied on our ability to handle out-of-order declaration. So that's part one. Dependency management part two is you know when you're doing pound include in C and you're saying, hey, I want to use standard IO, uh, I want to use this uh, whatever, like you want to use other libraries um, and make those uh, available to you in your implementation effort. And then namespacing is like, you know, uh, I don't just want to uh, import those names directly, uh, but maybe I want to manage them so that if I have two libraries that both want to have short names for something, um, that's fine. I can actually use them at the same time by importing them under separate names and doing renames on import and stuff like that. So these were sort of the three major pieces um, and all of this stuff is supported now. So let me um, let me just do a demo and then we'll, in my usual rambling style, I will sort of branch off and talk about internal stuff and and, uh, and, and other features that, uh, that were implemented or changes that had to be made in order to accommodate these uh, user visible features. So uh, the first thing is uh, you'll note that um, uh, rather than having test1.ion just sort of in the top level and, and so on, there's now a, a subdirectory for each of them. And, and one, of, one of them, test1, even has a subdirectory of its own. Um, and uh, the convention here is um, there's a set of search paths. And um, by default, the set of search paths consists of the system packages for the ion home directory. Uh, the current working directory, and then also anything in the semicolon separated list of directories in the ion path environment variable. And so anytime you reference a package, those are resolved against that set of search paths. Uh, and so you put your files in a directory, um, all the ion files, and they're all slurped up in no particular order. So this is a very kind of convention over configuration approach where you don't have to list them anywhere. Um, you just put them in a directory. You don't have to make a list of the files that constitute the package. They're just implicitly all the ion files in a given directory, uh, which is pretty nice. So here's the sort of thing you can do. Um, for, first off, let me mention that there is an implicit package import for everything, which is the built-in package. So um, all the type info stuff that we previously had in a uh, like a, in a string that was baked into the code is now in a separate file, and it's in this built-in package. And so all of this stuff is imported uh, directly with no name prefix or anything into every other package. So that's one thing. Uh, and so that's implicitly available. Um, but then beyond that, if you want like libc right now, there's just a few things available. Um, and, um, and so you can say, I want to import the specific symbol printf from libc. Um, and let me show you that um, if I, uh, if I exclude that, um, you should get a unresolved name error because that symbol is no longer available. You could also do this. This means the same thing as having an empty list. Um, but anyway, so you can import it sort of specifically if you don't want to do a bulk import or um, whatever, you can just do this. So import and then a, a package path, uh, which is a dot separated list of identifiers and then optionally a semicolon separated list of names. And this should this is supposed to remind you of the other things we have for um, that are kind of brace lists, right? Like uh, like structs and function bodies and uh, enums and stuff like that, um, where you know the the brace uh, the the brace uh, grouping it designates a list. So um, this is one way to do it. Um, as I show here, you can also do renames on import. So, um, oh, and, and, and this, this notation you're seeing here is a relative path import. So if you do import libc, it always means the global libc. So uh, it doesn't mean the sub package of the current package called libc. It's always the global kind of slash libc slash whatever, right? 
Um, if you use the dot prefix, that just means uh, something that's local to the current package. This is a sub package. Uh, and you can see this is that this is the subtest one package over here, and uh, this is the implementation. So uh, you can see that here we're we're importing and we're using this uh, rename notation where um, the local symbol, what will be called locally, is on the left, and then this is on the right is what we're importing. So it's importing the func one, and and it's renaming it locally to subtest one underscore func one. Um, and similarly here. Uh, we're renaming get char to get c uh, to gc, and so you can use this locally. Um, but if you look at the uh, at the C code, you know it's still under its original name. So it's this is just a local designator uh, when you want to have shorthands uh, or whatever. Um, one thing that should jump out is that um, we're doing an import from libc twice. So um, because we're doing out of order composition of files in a single package. Um, imports have an important feature, which is that they're idempotent. So you can import a package multiple times. First of all, just like the basic import, even without bringing in any specific names, just the import itself, which forces parsing of that other package. You can do that uh, idempotently. So if you do it multiple times, only the first time actually does anything. Um, but even after the first time, you can you can bring in more symbols. So you could, for example, do this, and that's fine. And then you could do this, right? You could um, uh, you could you, you could have a, a different and this could be in a different file so these are not you know because the from what the compiler sees it just sees concatenation of all the different files in the same directory uh, these different import directives for libc could be in different files and so you wouldn't you don't want to have to coordinate them right you can just put them in each file based on what they need maybe you want to put it in a unified imports.ion file that's probably a good convention but you can make them local and there's no weird order issues. You don't have to make them uh, unique across the package. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing you can do is you can just do bulk imports. So and I guess I have some, I don't have to change the code in place. I can show some, uh, I can just show some existing uses of it, I think. Right here. Um, so uh, you can just use this, you know, ellipsis notation, which we already use for vargs. Um, we can just use this here, um, and this will import all symbols under their original names, um, except for symbols that were imported in turn. So, for example, if um, let me show you what I mean. Suppose that I remove printf from here. Um, well, okay, let, let me not do it that way. Um, but basically, if uh, no, we, we can do it that way. Um, say we both import something under that name, and we also import everything. So first of all, that should work. Let me just make sure that still works. Um, and then if we do subtest one ion, suppose this thing actually. Oh, it already does. So that's a good example. Uh, you can see this thing actually imports. Um, this thing imports uh, printf. So locally, you could do printf, right? No problem. Um, however, if I, even though I'm doing this dot, dot, dot import, if I remove printf from here, even though I'm doing the dot, dot, dot import, I should get an error. Because uh, when you do the dot, dot, dot import, you only get symbols that were that are so-called home symbols, things that are native to that package. So I get all these, I get func1, func2, 3, and 4, but I don't get printf or any other symbols that may have been imported from other packages. Um, so that's how that works. Um, let's see, what else in that vein did I want to talk about? So yeah, that, that's almost it in terms of just the user visible stuff. Uh, it works, uh, it's pretty lightweight. Um, so far I haven't uh, really found anything that annoys me about this approach. Um, I'll mention one thing that isn't implemented that's on the list, but which is really easy. I just haven't done it. Is um, uh, which one call it? Um, you actually can't do this. You couldn't do. You know, so, suppose I so I do this import libc up here. I can't actually, even though it has the list of all the symbols in there now that it's parsed it. I, I, right now, there's actually no way to do libc dot uh, what what is it? Sprint app or something like that. Um, that's just a small 
thing I didn't get to yesterday. So you can't use the package uh, itself as a sort of namespace dot thing. You have to actually flatten the symbols on import like that. But um, that's I'm going to add that today or whatever. It's it's not a big deal. Uh, easy to implement. But uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of those features. Uh, let, let me also show you uh, a bit more about how the command interfa interface changed in order to accommodate this. So uh, here I'm just in MSYS. So I, I tested this so far on uh, MSVC, uh, MSYS GCC, and Linux GCC. Um, so first, uh, let, let me just show myself compiling it from scratch. Um, so as before, you still have main.c, you just compile it. Um, the command line is now that you don't specify a, uh, a file, like a, you previously specified the .ion file you wanted to compile. Now you specify the package, which is a, you know, so it's like I do test one uh, and it, it does its thing. Um, and there's way more diagnostic output now, uh, which will eventually be turned off. But I figured uh, now that kind of things are new, uh, this will help people understand what's going on. So uh, you can see that it's adding all these search paths uh, the, the the first uh, the first one is from uh, Ion Home, so there's an Ion Home variable you have to define, and it uh, adds a slash system packages to that, and that's the the first uh, search path in the list of imp uh, search paths. Next, there's the current working directory, that's the default one, and then after that, there's everything in like I said, the Ion path uh, user defined environment variable. So you can add stuff here, and here I just added a bunch of stuff just to test it. Um, but all of these are searched in order when you try to do a package import. Um, and then when you do ion test one, it tries to find the package called test one. Um, and it finds it and recursively does imports. Uh, well, you can see it first off imports built in because that's universal. Um, and then it does test one and that ends up depending on libc and it ends up depending on test one slash subtest one. Um, and then you can see here all the reachable symbols. And I'm going to talk more about the reachability stuff and the cool stuff that we can do with that uh, now. Um, but basically, uh, for now, the way it works is um, it will only compile anything that's reachable from the main package that you specify. So if you write test1, uh, everything referenced by anything in the test1 package, directly or indirectly, is going to be part of the compilation. Um, and so here, the you see these multiple phases of these, uh, after the step where it says finalizing reachable symbols, you see multiple phases of these um, new reachable symbols being printed. And so here's the initial set. Um, and, and in this initial set, it still hasn't visited, um, it still hasn't visited all, it hasn't visited any function bodies and it's only visited some structure and union bodies. And so after this, it does sort of an iterative, uh, it just does a loop over all the reachable symbols so far, finalizes them. In the process of finalizing them, it can end up adding more reachable symbols, and those get added to the end of the list, and so those will be encountered later on. And once we're done with that list, we have kind of fully finalized everything in the transitive closure, and we can do code generation. And so you can see this is what happens here, and finally generates the C file. And then when you have the C file, you can just compile it like uh, like any other C file. And uh, same, same thing with test two. Um, and actually same thing for Noir. I don't think Noir will compile from here because I don't have the right command line switches. But you know, if I, Noir still works um, as before. And actually, let me show you a thing I had to change. Or I, I, not, not that I had to change, but I changed to made it more easy to work with that kind of project. Um, but you can see everything here prefixed by four is noir related, so it's the same sort of deal. Uh, and that still works. Same as before. Um, let me just quickly talk about that noir thing I changed. So uh, previously, the way we were building noir is that the... Um, we would process the ion file to generate the C file, but then we would have the a main.c file, which would pound include the generated C code, and that would sort of be the top level thing that you built. Uh, now it's more like uh, other ion packages in the sense that um, the ion package itself is expected to define main and, and define, it'll be sort of the top level thing. And then if you want to have other kind of sidecar C code, um, you use pound, uh, pound foreign now with the source directive to specify that. 
Um, and so that way in the generated C code, um, you, um, you get these includes at the end in order to splice in uh, these kinds of, uh, of, of C-based uh, kind of complements to the ion code. Um, so, so that's not much more self-contained. So you get a fully self-contained .c file that you can compile. You still need to have the right command line switches if you're using foreign libraries. That's that hasn't been changed. But at least you have a single C file that contains all the dependencies you need. Uh, and if if it doesn't contain the dependencies you need, you can add them using this notation here. So uh, that's another new thing. Um, all right, let me talk about reachability a little bit. So uh, in the course of implementing all this stuff. Um, it turned out that I, I realized uh, something that should have been obvious in hindsight, which is that um, given the way we designed the resolver to handle out of order declarations, uh, it, sh it, it falls out as a side effect almost that we get what's called tree shaking automatically, basically for free, at least, and, and, it, and it turned out to be true. Like, so that was my hunch after thinking about it when I started to work on packages, and it turned out to be true after they were implemented uh, once I had fixed bugs that this exposed in the process. So what do I mean by tree shaking? Um, and I actually mean something slightly more general than the conventional notion of tree shaking. So uh, tree shaking in programming languages, uh, I think the term originates in Lisp, but it's basically, uh, well, and it's, it's yeah, like they say, it's much harder in dynamic languages than in static languages. But it's just the idea of dead code elimination, really, right? Like uh, dead code elimination at the symbol level where um, when you're generating, well, in, us, in our case, we're generating C code, right? Um, when we're generating C code, we only want to include symbol definitions that are actually useful for our program. So I mentioned that reachability is determined by starting right now from the main package and you know, basically recursively fanning out from there um, to discover what's necessary, the true dependencies. Uh, and then that's what we actually code generate once we're done. Um, and so that's a form of tree shaking. And uh, like after, after fixing some bugs that, that turned up, this basically was totally free. Like I didn't have to do any work for it. Uh, I, I just uh, like essentially the way it works is if you go to... Um, if you go to all this stuff and you look at, I don't know, sorted decals, you know, you you traverse the sorted list of declarations, uh, and that only contains an entry if something was actually reachable. Um, and so all of this stuff here, there's a few things that I do global walks. Uh, that's mostly just a, but that's not for symbol stuff. That's just for directives like uh, all these pound foreign things and that can be optimized later. But but everything else basically that involves actual you know, generating symbols is done based on sorted sims rather than just doing a global package walk or anything like that. So all of the tree shaking is now just sort of falls out from the way we do reachability analysis implicitly during resolving. Um, but it's actually crazier than that in a sense. Uh, and uh, l let me show you what I mean. So, so, so first off, let me, let me talk about the benefits of that tree shaking. Um, the first is that the C compiler for us is the bottleneck by something like 30x, meaning for, for, for say, a million lines of code or some large amount of code, um, the C compiler, and this is broadly true whether we're using MSVC or Clang, uh, although Clang is a bit fast, uh, it's much faster with the linking in terms of the compilation, it's roughly the same. Um, it, it's, it's basically true that they take at least 30 and sometimes 100 or more times longer than us to compile a given amount of code. Um, and the result of that is being able to generate less C code is massively high leverage. So for example, imagine this. Suppose that over time we end up with a few hundred thousand lines of library code or just other code that we want to use and it's written in ION. And we want to write an application um, that uses some, some subset of a bunch of different things. And the, the sum of all the different packages that we use in terms of the total package code for the dependencies could be pretty vast, right? Like it could be uh, 100,000 lines or whatever. But suppose we only use, say, 10,000 lines out of that 100. Um, if, if Since the bottleneck is the C code compilation by the external C compiler, uh, we will only generate the C code for the stuff we actually need. And so given that you can think of the C compiler's time being essentially 100% of our compilation pipeline time, that, that case I just mentioned represents basically a 10x speedup. 
Um, so you can have massive libraries, and if you only use a subset, the C compiler never sees it. And so we get these massive, massive speedups. It's actually better than that, though. So that's traditional tree shaking, although normally when people talk about tree shaking, they're not trying to make their C compiler faster. Um, but like, for example, in the JavaScript world, when they use things like Google's uh, closure tools, they are kind of trying to be able to use, say, the JVM or some massive set of dependencies and only pull in what they need and, and not have to bog down the browser needlessly. So it is kind of similar. But for us, this is really about making the C compiler faster, at least uh, sort of to a first order approximation. Um, and that just works. It just falls out from uh, from the design as a as a neat side effect. Um, but what I realized is that actually we get more than that, uh, at least if we want it, which is um, when when you do a package import with this new system. So I do import package on something. By default, import package. Uh, well, first off, often it doesn't do anything because the package has already been imported. Um, but even when you do have to do a compile the first time you see that package. Um, the only thing that really happens is parsing. Um, so when you parse a package for the first time, it has to go through the, the package directory and it parses uh, all the .ion files there, builds a list of, of declarations, and this is purely syntactic. There's no resolution going on at this point. Uh, and then you know it makes a big list of them and that's the, that's the package. Um, and then having done that, um, we process imports so um well oh so the first thing we so so we uh, so we parse the package which just is literally calling the the parser to build a list of, of ast nodes for the declarations um then we we add the package declarations and what this entails is essentially making a symbol table entry for each declaration but this is really just setting up an association between the name of the declaration and the symbol, but the symbol still hasn't been resolved. It's just setting up that, that association so that if someone else wants to refer to that symbol, they know, hey, this name corresponds to this symbol, but there, there's still not any resolution going on. These are just some hash table inserts. So these are extremely cheap. Um, and then, um, Right, so that's just setting up the symbol table. And then after that, we have to process the package's own imports. And this is really just like calling import on these things and then adding uh, you know, name associations for any imported symbols that you want. Um, but this is really the only thing that happens when you depend on a package. That's it, there's really nothing more to it. It's, it's not doing type checking. It's not doing order resolution. Uh, it's certainly not doing C code gen. And it's certainly not, you know, it's and, and, and it's not passing any of that to the C compiler, but it's not even doing the type checking, which is kind of magical. Um, and uh, let me show you how that checks out. And, and I want to emphasize that this is going to be off by default because it has counterintuitive behavior when you're actively working on code. Um, but it's something that you can use for packages that are kind of third, tar third party and that you aren't working on. Or you can use it purely for deployment when you're making a, you know, a kind of release build or something. Um, but but, uh, but let me just show show what I mean. So um, we have this test one package, and it's importing stuff over here. And let's just say we're importing everything just to make it very explicit. Um, when I do uh, ion test one. You know, it's importing the subtest one package, and so it's building up. You know, it's, it's it's parsing it, and so in particular, if I do something weird like I just type this thing at top level, oh, and I see I have a buffer overflow here, so I need to look at what that is. Um, must be a non-termination bug. Um, that's annoying. All right, I'll fix it after. But yeah, you can see it, it, it still parses it, right? So when uh, test one ends up importing subtest one, it still parses it. Um, and um, but but let's say we define so first. Let's just define this bogus func, and we know that no one not, no one in here depends on bogus func because we just defined it. Um, suppose I put in total nonsense here, like it still has to parse, but it's total syntactic nonsense, or it's total semantic nonsense. Like maybe it's I don't know. I guess that's a pointer, so that's actually valid. But I don't know. Um, what what can we do? Um, maybe we multiply a string by two, or we you know we left shift it and then uh, you know 
I don't know. Random stuff like that. Um, this still this still passes. And the reason is, even though it knows that bogus func is associated with this function definition, it hasn't actually resolved it in this mode. And so until it gets referenced from something that we do depend on, um, until we um, do something like this, now we get a type error or a resolve error um, where it says line four. So it says, you know, ASDF is an unresolved name. But note that as soon as we, um, as soon as we comment this out, the error disappears. And so the pretty magical thing is that it's doing the absolute bare minimum of work uh, in order to compile the package. Like, it's it's extremely lazy, right? Um, and again, I want to emphasize this part of it, not the C code generation side, which will always be fully reachability-based in order to speed things up, but this phase of the, the, the extreme laziness is something you can turn off very easily uh, by just forcing all packages to be fully resolved. You, you, you just basically, I mean, and you can do this in the code very easily, but like, um, if you look at ion.c right now, um, I'm calling this function resolve package sims on the main package, but I could do, um, you know, I could do like, if I wanted to just sort of do that for everything, I could just do this. I think that should work. Um, And now, even though this thing is commented out, you can see it, it always gets uh, reported. And uh, if we if we fix it, it now passes. If we turn it back on, you know. Um, so that sort of thing um, is how that works. And it's basically just based on the fact that in the resolver, and just going way back, in the resolver, we do everything based on reachability already implicitly, because when we see something, we visit it recursively, and we use that. We use that originally to resolve the order of things, so we could do uh, ordering on the code generation side and detect cycles and so on. But it also just shakes out that this only discovers stuff that's actually reachable if you start with a set of roots. Um, so that's super neat, um, and uh, you know. Um, so that was, oops, that was a happy discovery for me, um, that that just worked like that. Why is that now being, okay. Let's put it back like that. Um, and you can also see, I mean, it's kind of implied by the fact that it compiles. But if you look at, uh, if you look at stuff here, um, there's no bogus func anywhere. Like, this, this, there, there's nothing here that um, that references those unreachable symbols. So, in in these small examples, it's not super important. But you can imagine, if you have a, a large set of libraries and uh, you only use sort of a sampling, there's a large library where you just want one function. Uh, now you don't have to pay for the expensive part of the process now with with this approach. So that's uh, pretty cool. Um, okay, I can feel my uh, my sleep deprivation kicking in here. Please bear with me. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, what needed to change. There's too much to cover, honestly, in detail because it was like two solid days of just hardcore coding and refactoring. Um, it was not very hard, actually, but it was a bunch of work. Um, but so I can't really cover the code changes in detail, but I will talk about the high level changes. Um, uh, I think you saw part of it, which is there's all the stuff that's kind of explicitly new uh, related to packages. Packages as a concept didn't exist before. Uh, a package for us is, uh, let's see what I put in that struct. 
the package is there's a package path, which is, which is the ion notion of a path, not really a file system path. Then there's the full path, which is the file system path. There's a list of declarations, which is just the syntactic entities. There's a symbols table, which there's both a list and a map um, for just for convenience. Uh, and then there's an external name, which is um, uh, the external name of a package is used to control. Uh, it's used to control when you're generating C code, uh, what prefix should be used for symbols of, in that package. So as a data structure, that's just what a package is. There's really not much to it. And then like I showed, there's there are all these functions for, um, for uh, you know, you can resolve a simple a symbol, you can resolve a name uh, against a package. It just does a lookup in this hash map. Um, you can add a package. Um, Adding a package is really just about, you know, setting it up in the package map um, so that when other people try to refer to that package, they get the, existence ins the existing instance rather than trying to recompile the package from the file system. Um, there are these sort of enter leave scope helpers. And um, this is one of the things that had to change is that previously we had all these things called like global globals and global, map, global sims map and stuff like that. Uh, now there's nothing like that. There's just a current package. And the current package is whatever package you're currently compiling or, or currently resolving in, I should say. So anytime you're doing a resolve sim, anytime you're doing something that involves resolving a name to a symbol, the current package is always the, the context in which that occurs. And so there's a lot of cases due to the out of order resolution where you're resolving something in one package, and then it refers its definition refers to something defined in another package, and it has to recursively go and resolve that. And so you're often moving between sort of package scopes. And this enter package, leave package helper is really just, you know, kind of pushing and popping the package scope. So that's all that is. Um, let's just scroll through the code and see if anything pops out. Um, one thing that I did throughout is that I have a hash table called resolved resolved sims. Yeah, set you you can call set resolve sim and get resolve sim on any kind of entity that you want to associate a resolve symbol to. So this could be a symbol actually a symbol resolves to itself. So just as a convenience, I ended up doing it that way, where if you pass a symbol to get resolve sim, you get back the symbol itself so that it's handled uniformly. But for other things, like if you have an expression node that has a name, uh, if you call get resolve sim, that will give you the resolve symbol for that. So this is how you associate this kind of uh, scope resolution data with, with uh, AST nodes. It's all fully externalized in a hash table, which is a much cleaner design, even though it does slow things, things down by like 5% or so, but uh, I think a worthwhile trade-off. Um, so that's what that stuff is. And you can see here that when you uh, create a new symbol, it actually associates the symbol with itself, which is the thing I just mentioned. Um, and then for other things, you can see, for example, when you uh, when you set up a, a, defini a declaration, so you create the symbol for a declaration, uh, the declaration becomes associated with um, the symbol. So then later in the code generator or whatever, if you see a declaration and you want to know, hey, what, what, does, what did this actually resolve to, you can go and look at that and see what his name is. Um, because, you know, a declaration is a purely syntactic thing, but a symbol is kind of a more semantic thing. Um, and you can see here, uh, we, we had this function before simget. Now simget, rather than doing a lookup in the global sim, uh, sim map, it now just looks in the current package map, uh, current packages symbol table. Um, this is another thing, a small change. Um, and this is another kind of idempotency thing um, that's very intentional. Uh, it used to be that duplicate definitions were always uh, a problem. But now, uh, as a side effect, well, not, as, not, I guess not as a side effect, but kind of to go along with the package design, if you, uh, just like you can import a package multiple times, you can also import symbols from packages multiple times uh, as long uh, to the same name as long as those names refer to the same thing. So for example, I could do, you know, I could do this again. Um, and that's going to work. Uh, if I had made this something else, if I had made this print F, for example, um, it's going to say that's a duplicate definition, hopefully. Yeah, you can see uh, it says uh, duplicate definition, and this is the previous definition. Um, well, this is maybe a little confusing the way it's denoting it, but, uh, but
but I mean, it's, 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 it, it, anyway, so you can see, so you're allowed to, you're allowed to have two entries with the same name, but they have to refer to the same symbol. So this is a very nice item potency property. And again, it just kind of falls out if you do it correctly. Um, is that it? I can't remember what change I was on doing, right? I think that's it. Um, and so that's really all it's doing. You can see when you're trying to put in a new symbol in the current package map, if there's already a symbol there, it has to match. Otherwise, there's a duplicate definition error. Um, so that's the idea. Um, yep, and this is stuff is mostly unchanged. Uh, I should mention that just like packages have external names that are used for C code generation, symbols also optionally have external names that are used for code generation. So for example, um, if you look at the built-in uh, if you look at the built-in package, you th these are the things that are auto-imported into every other package. So right now it's just the type info. Um, these names here, if you look at the generated C code, are uh, exported unprefixed. Uh, th this here is a result of the package having a special external name, which is just the empty string. So the built-in package has a uh, has a external name that's an empty string so that you don't get any prefixes on, uh, on, on its symbols. But in addition to this, you can also, uh, on a per symbol level, you can also control uh, kind of the export side. And so this is how foreign works. Um, well, I guess there's a bunch of examples actually, if you do standard io.ion. The way this works here is um, when you use this foreign directive, aside from doing other things, uh, it also sets by default the um, it sets up uh, the external name to match this. So normally, if this had been so, this is in the libc package. If uh, if I remove this, well, there there would probably be other errors. But actually, let me show you because it'll probably be instructive. Um, but yeah, you can see it's complaining about unresolved externals. Um, and you can kind of get a hint of that if you look at this. It's because uh, by default, everything gets the package prefix, right? So it gets libc underscore printf. But in the case where you want to have stuff that's kind of like binding to a foreign symbol, you want to be able to control exactly how it's, it's exported, uh, what external name that is used for, for that. So foreign does that by default. Um, you can actually also do stuff like, um, Um, like suppose you want to just call this print for whatever reason. Like you want to say, okay, I like the name print. It's shorter than printf. You can also do this, um, where you have an explicit argument to specify the uh, the external name. And now, if I have um, if there's some printf code, let's just make sure it's something we know is executing. Um, You know, you could you could do something like this, uh, I think, and that should work. Or not. Oh, we still have to import it, of course. So um, you can see here when you're when you're doing this stuff. Um, even for external things, and actually I would say it's especially useful for external things, you may want to have a, a, another name internally than externally, and uh, using foreign with an explicit string argument lets you do that. But if you just leave it as is, it's going to export under its own name, but without the package prefix. Um, all right. And actually, this should also print an error. It should say there's nothing called print. Yeah. All right, uh, more scrolling through the code. Um, mo yeah, I don't think really a lot of this stuff has changed. This is where the get resolve sim stuff is. Um, you know, the main thing you can see here is that when you're resolving type spec names, it uses set resolve sim to resolve the type spec to the symbol. So, um, 
That way you don't have to somehow repeat these resolution steps in the generator. They're resolved in the, in the resolver as you'd expect. And then the generator can just look them up when it needs to see, oh, what is the, what does this uh, type spec refer to, right? Because it doesn't want to have to recapitulate that entire analysis, which is arbitrarily complicated almost. So it just uses this hash table to communicate. Um, yeah, and I think the rest of it is is pretty pretty much the same deal. Um, let, let me just scroll to see if there's anything that jumps out. But I think that was pretty much it there. Um, this code is still not as clean as I would want it to be, but uh, everything related to sort of scope and resolving symbols and the relationship between the declarations and symbols and so on. All that stuff got like 10 times better as a result of this work, so I'm pretty happy with that. Um, all right, yeah, we already covered this code. Um, here you can see the code that only uh, that only takes stuff that's in their home package. So it, it iterates over everything that's in the symbols list, but you can see here it checks whether the home package of that symbol is actually the current is that package, and only then do we resolve it and so on. And there's the the same thing uh, when we do imports, I think, where um, you can see here when when you when you do, when you try to do an import all, all really means the specific set of things or the the set of things that are in their home package. Um, it should be noted though that if you use um, so what's an example right so we import printf from here you can actually do this and i don't know if this is a feature or a bug to be honest but you can do this if you use an explicit name it will let you import it uh just fine but if you use the dot 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 for bulk import it only gets the things that are uh, that are in their home package Oh, I guess it wasn't a good test, but uh, if we do this and then leave this up, that should work. So, so, right, we're getting that import, but now if I remove this, we don't get it. Um, and also, if I use ellipsis, we're not going to get it because it's not a home symbol. So, yeah. I think that's mostly it for the for the resolver changes. Uh, it was mostly it mostly slotted in. There were a bunch of hard coded assumptions about kind of globals and things, but uh, the resolver itself stood extremely robust in the face of these changes, which uh, was a uh, not entirely surprising, but was definitely uh, made, made me made me happy. Um, now the generator um, again also didn't have to change very fundamentally. But one change that did have to happen consistently is that um, previously, anytime we were referring to an identifier, like a C-level identifier, we were just using kind of the nominal name from the AST node. Like if there's an AST node that had an expression, like, you know, there's an expression name and that has a certain nominal name like foo, we would just say, oh, let's just say foo, right? Like it would be very dumb in that way. Um, but now we have all this namespacing and whatnot. And so we need uh, to handle that in a different way. And so uh, there is this function get gen name. And um, the, the, the main function is get gen name or default. So you can say either, um, you can give a pointer to a thing that has a resolve symbol and then there's a fallback name if there's no associated thing. Uh, and basically it looks up in this, uh, well, this is just a cache. Uh, this is what it really does. It tries to find the resolve symbol. If there is a resolve symbol, then there's a cascade of possibilities. If there's an explicit external name, like for, for the foreign printf thing we talked about before, then the C-level name is just that thing verbatim, no, no, uh, no, no fanciness. If the package has an external name, um, then you just concatenate them. So there's no underscore concatenation. So the external name is, if you want to have you know test one underscore, the external name really needs to have the trailing underscore. And that's auto-initialized to have a trailing underscore by default. But my point is if you initialize it manually, you are not forced to have an underscore prefix. It could be anything because it just does a flat concatenation like this. Uh, but if there's no external name, then it just uses the flat symbol name. Um, and if there's no resolve symbol associated with it, then it uses the default name. So this is used in a few cases. Um, actually, the case where this is used is often for local variables. 
um, resolves uh, the the resolved symbols cache does not do anything for local vari local variables. Uh, even though local variables are symbols as well, but they only exist temporarily. So if any time you have a reference to a local variable and you try to resolve it to a symbol, you're going to get null, and that's expected. So when you get resolve sim on a name and you get null, that means, oh, this is a local variable or something, and uh, then, we, then we grab the default fallback name from the AST node rather than from the resolve symbols cache. That's the idea. So let me show you some examples. Like here, uh, we have a type spec name get gen name or default. We either get the name associated with this thing that's been resolved or we use the ST name. Right now, this is actually not necessary because we can't have local, locally scoped uh, type spec definitions that could resolve. Uh, so this is a little bit of future proofing, but the case where this is used is um, expression names. So for expression names, uh, we either try to get the resolve name from the associated symbol, but if it's a local variable, there's not going to be an associated uh, symbol. And um, we're, then we're just going to grab the name from the expression. So, the, you know, if you have like X in this case, you know, X is not going to mean like test one underscore X. It's just going to mean plain X because X is a local symbol in this context. So that's what that's doing. And then we have a lot of cases that just use the plain function where it knows that it's dealing with, um, you know, like a top level symbol and it just calls get gen name without a default. Um, and so this is how you generate all these, um, you know, type defs and declarations and whatnot using this function. Um, so aside from miscellaneous bug fixes, that was pretty much it. Uh, the other thing that changed, like I said at the very beginning, is that rather than walking over global list of declarations or symbols, uh, all the stuff that actually generates symbol definitions on the C side now walks over the sorted sims array. So only stuff that's in here will actually be generated. Um, and I think that's about it in terms of the walkthrough I wanted to do. Um, there's like 15, 1,500 lines of code changes since uh, yesterday. And so uh, I don't want to walk over it on a line-by-line -line basis, but I think this level of detail is probably appropriate. And if you're super interested in the specifics, you can look at the diffs. Um, but I think that's pretty much it. Um, and I guess I did want to emphasize that, you know, I, 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 te I tested this on, like, you know, it works on DCC, it works on... Uh, Emsys 2 with GCC, um, and I've also tested it on Linux. So uh, this works as well. In fact, even Noir, although it's not really compiling the C code, just compiling the ion side things. Uh, so all of this should work on on those systems. Uh, I got confirmation that it worked on Macintosh as well, since I'm just the only OS specific thing here I'm doing is uh, POSIX for the directory walk. So, uh, but, but, you know, do give it a try and let me know if you have issues on your operating system or your configuration or whatever. Um, but that's pretty much it. So that was a big push. And I think it was the last major remaining feature uh, before we can really use this in a day-to-day -day fashion without um, being frustrated. Um, so with that out of the way, let me uh, look at questions before I move on to the very short uh, Risk Five and well, maybe not that short, uh, but move on to the Risk Five quick intro. Let's see here. Let me just catch up. Yeah, so uh, someone was asking, so it searches the ion path for the file, but what happens when there are two files with equal names in the path? Your, so first off, it doesn't search for files, it searches for packages, uh, which are directories. Um, and you're supposed to not have collisions between packages. Uh, like, there, there's not supposed to be a, a, a aliases in the search paths. And the way you ensure that is by having vendor prefixes or something like that, um, if, if you want to be good about it. So you can have vendor prefixes, um, and that's one way to do it. So, I mean, this is kind of a standard, uh, I guess, problem with, with any system along these lines. 
but uh, yeah. Um, boom, boom, boom. All right. That doesn't look like there's a ton of. Let's see here. Doesn't look like there's a ton of questions about this, which is good. Um, but yeah, uh, give it a try if you get the opportunity, and let me know if you run into any bugs, so I will, I can fix them. Um, all right. So let's talk about uh, the upcoming. Uh, I guess I, I'll, I'll still be doing a little bit. Like there's at least one feature in the packages that I need uh, to add for the being able to do explicit, you know, lib lib dot c printf and stuff like that, uh, which I'll probably do today. But beyond that, um, I think we're now at the stage where anything I'll add will be very marginal quality of life, minor improvements rather than anything deeply fundamental. Uh, unless some some cat catastrophic mistake is discovered, and then of course there'll be bug fixes and, and other things like that. Um, and so uh, starting, I would say today is maybe the transition day, but starting on uh, on day 22, which is Friday for me, uh, for real, um, we'll be moving on to the sort of risk five portion of the project. Um, and so. Uh, We'll be moving back and forth along the way, but we'll be uh, we'll be spending at least a few weeks doing stuff focused on Risk Five. So uh, this is kind of the transitional period between the purely software focused stuff and moving into things that are not really hardware design yet, but things that are starting to get more into that side of things. So let me say a little bit uh, about Risk Five and um, and what my plan is for the coming weeks in that respect. So. Um, uh, the first thing I would recommend you do is you check out the uh, the risk. So, so Risk Five is an open instruction set architecture, um, and uh, you can see the specification if you go to this URL. This is the the GitHub URL, probably the easiest way to get it. Um, and so, uh, if you if you want to get into the right state of mind, I will go over some stuff on on Friday. I won't go over the details of the eyes uh, today. Um, but if you want to sort of do some advanced reading prep here, I would highly recommend it specifically, at the very least, the first 25 pages, uh, which covers the base integer ISA. Um, but you but feel free to read ahead as well. But um, let me just bring up, bring it up here. So as you can see, uh, like I'm, I'm not going to repeat this verbatim, but uh, it's, it's a new instruction set architecture. Um, that came out of uh, Berkeley. So it came out of uh, a group uh, that was, I guess, uh, affiliated and supported. And I don't know if he was technically the group head or if he was just affiliated, but but David Patterson, a bunch of people around David Patterson, who was one of the original risk people, I guess, uh, and, and famously, um, I guess, wrote a famous paper with, I guess, Dave Ditzel on, um, I think it's it was called the case the case for a reduced instruction set computer with Dave Detzel and David Patterson. Um, maybe it was just Patterson. Oh yeah, no, it is Dave Detzel. Um, so uh, they 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 didn't quite invent the idea of risk. Um, there was some earlier work by um, what's his face. I actually don't know if you say John Koch or John Cock. Um, but uh, th there was earlier work at IBM um, on instruction set architectures that, in hindsight, um, uh, were precursors of RISC. And uh, you can even also look at old processor architectures, like some of the, the Cray architectures that were Lodestar architectures had some uh, primordial RISC ideas. Uh, but anyway, uh, one of the co-authors of, of, of the RISC-V specification and the design is David Patterson, who was sort of one of the OGs in this game for RISC. Um, and so I, I think they've been working on this since maybe the late 2000s, so like maybe 2009 or so. Um, but it's really taken off in, well, in industry in the last year and a half, at least certain parts of industry, uh, but in academia even a few years before that. So what exactly is it? Well, um, you know, it's, it's an open instruction set architecture that you can use uh, to implement your own processors. You can use it for academic research and so on. So it's not a set of, you know, it's not giving you the source code. Uh, well, 
the, the same people are also releasing source code for hardware designs that you can use, but the specification itself is just a specification. It's an architecture, not a microarchitecture. So it's specifying a set of instructions and their expected behavior and so on. Um, just like, you know, just like x86 uh, has a set of instructions that are supported uh, both on Intel processors and, and uh, AMD processors and so on. It's an instruction set architecture, not a specific processor or microarchitecture. Um, one of the interesting things about it is, aside from being RISC, so it's kind of a clean RISC design. Um, it's it's if you've seen MIPS before, it you can it, it's kind of in that lineage, but removing a bunch of the stuff in MIPS that is now considered uh, to have gone by the wayside to be kind of failed experiments in most, in, at least in general purpose instruction set architecture design, like delay uh, branch delay slots. Um, so it's it's a it's a risk, but it's not one of these risks from the early 90s that was. Um, uh, sacrificing um, a bunch of things in order for nominal simplicity and performance, which often turned out not to quite be as high performance in practice as just doing something slightly more convenient. So it's it's kind of learned all those lessons, uh, and it's a very clean ISA. It's it's convenient to, to target uh, from a compiler. It's even reasonable to write by hand. Um, and one of the interesting things about it, aside from just being kind of a good clean design, is that the way it's tiered. So um, it's tiered into, it has the base instruction set, which is uh, comes in, I guess, a few different variants. There's a, at least a 64-bit and a 32-bit version. There's also even a 128-bit version, which is a little bit weird. Um, but if you look at the 32-bit the version, um, th this is a very small subset. I think it has something like 50 instructions, um, which has all the basic um, sort of integer-oriented instructions you need in a general purpose computing instruction set. So um, it has, you know, it has adds and subtracts. It has uh, shifts and bitwise operations. It has uh, loads and stores to memory. It has, uh, you know, control flow for doing, rel uh, you know, uh, two-way relative branches, um, uh, function call style, jump and link, uh, all this stuff. So it has, it has all the things you need for the very basics. Um, but it doesn't have stuff that you might expect if you're coming from a desktop background. Like, for example, uh, you can see that there is a standard extension for integer multiplication and division. So the base ISA does not contain multiplication. Um, it's really intended to be a, a usable but very small subset uh, that is appropriate in embedded applications. And in fact, embedded applications of a specific sort is really where you're seeing RISC-V take off in industry. Uh, and by embedded, I don't mean discrete microcontrollers, you know, like the kind that are in, you know, your uh, washing machine or whatever, like, uh, or your Arduino. I mean the kind of embedded microcontrollers that are inside other systems on chip. So um, inside a modern system on a chip, uh, aside from the application processor or DS, you know, or any other kind of user visible uh, acceleration processors like GPUs or DSPs, uh, there's a ton of, of small scale um, control processors that are, you know, just like a, a normal discrete microcontroller is a small microprocessor with I.O. that can kind of sense the environment, like maybe it can read a temperature sensor or a rotary encoder dial that's run through a, a DAC or whatever, and then it can in turn also actuate itself and, and make changes in the environment, like it can drive an external motor or it can change an LED or whatever. Um, the, the sort of embedded microcontrollers that you see in SOCs are essentially the same idea, but rather than driving external I.O. at the pin level, it's sort of driving external I.O. internal to the SOC. So they're often used for this sort of uh, control uh, uh, control path task inside uh, systems on a chip so that you don't have to do those tasks either with hard-coded state machines or with you know, needlessly bulky and slow general purpose, uh, like uh, bigger scale processors. So people have had, uh, there's various um, third party, uh, like basically, I, like they're called IP cores, um, which in the hardware world means like an IP core is basically like a, a, a third party, typically third party component, like a library that you can buy from someone or download if it's open source and you can compile into your hardware design. And um, just like you can compile in, you know, the Lua VM into your, your, your engine and you can use it for scripting. Uh, it's a very vague analogy, but you can get like a, an IP core for an embedded microcontroller type thing. 
you can compile it with all your other stuff like your application processor, your IO blocks or whatever, and then you can hook up the signals internally so that this little embedded micro microprocessor can do control tasks. Um, and so traditionally this was, uh, you know, there were some vendors that did this for proprietary instruction sets. Um, um, but RISC-V has really, in industry, made a, a strong uh, stake there uh, to, it's already starting to replace a lot of proprietary ISIS in that area, of these sort of small-scale embedded microcontrollers in, in, in big SOCs. Uh, and so a lot of vendors that were previously working on the proprietary uh, versions of that kind of instruction set are now either straight up moved entirely to focusing on RISC-V or are at least offering RISC-V offerings alongside their more proprietary instruction set offerings. Um, so that's kind of one area where that's taken off. And for that kind of application, you really want to have a small, um, you, want, you want to have a small core instruction set because you don't want, you know, like floating point, for example, certainly, or stuff like that in most of these applications. Uh, you may want integer multiplication, but in a lot of applications, maybe you don't even need that. And, and multipliers, well, you can make slow, slow multipliers don't take up a lot of chip, chip area, but a slow multiplier also isn't a whole lot faster than just doing software emulated multiplication with, uh, you know, shifts and adds. So you can still synthesize multiplications if you need it, but in a lot of applications that are not performance sensitive, maybe you, you can just synthesize them or whatever, right? So it, even though this is a small set of instructions, you can do a lot with it actually. And for these applications, that's a, it's a major advantage. Um, and on that note, I, I've seen before people ask, like, why is there a 64-bit version uh, if the base instruction set is supposed to be this, like, really small subset that has, like, just the, the necessary subset of instructions? And what, I mean, one reason for that is, uh, well, if you want to have 32 and 64-bit versions of it, you should probably have parity. But even in these embedded microcontroller applications, um, quite often the internal system on a chip uh, data bus is 64-bit addressable, right? Like, you have... Um, you know, probably the address bits are not like there's probably not 64 address bits. Like it's probably you know uh, quite a bit less than that. You don't want to have the the bus routed everywhere with with 64 bits if you only use uh, 36 of them. But it's probably more than um, you know. You're probably addressing more than uh, than, than what's accessible with uh, with 32 bits on some of these big SOCs that that, that people use nowadays. So 64 bit capability is really important for that. Um, even in those applications. So anyway, I'm just kind of rambling because I'm sleep deprived. So please bear with me. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, I'll go over this in more ordered fashion once we start implementing it. Um, why is it not? Oh, I was looking at the wrong thing. Right. So uh, I would recommend off stream if you want to prep for the next stream where we really dive in, uh, take a look at this first section. Um, they give a list of the different instructions. They talk about the instruction encoding, which is the bit level encoding of how different types of instructions are encoded. Um, I'll, when we implement the, um, you know, the the emulator and the assembler and all that stuff, I'll talk a little bit about why the instruction encoding was designed the way it is. Like, it, there are some things that, from a software perspective, are pretty annoying to deal with, but make a lot of sense from a hardware perspective. Like, for example, the sign bit. Uh, of immediate operands is always in the same position, which means that you can start sign extension early before you fully decoded, uh, before you've done any decoding of the operand type um, or the instruction type, um, which apparent, I mean, in certain, at least in certain processor designs, uh, the sign extension for, for the immediate operands can be on the critical path. And so stuff like that kind of makes sense from a hardware perspective, but won't make a ton of sense to you at this point if you are coming from a software background. But as a side effect of that, it means that when you're doing this stuff in software, you end up having to do a bunch of bit manipulations to put things back into the, la the, the natural order from a software perspective. So I'll talk about that stuff on Friday. Um, but take a look at it and kind of formulate questions to yourself about how things work the way they do. Um, um, let's see here. If you've never done any assembly programming before, not even looked at this assembly for your C code, um, this may or may not uh, make a ton of sense. On Friday, I will try to give a, a very brief overview of the difference between kind of assembly and machine code versus something like C. Uh, but I'm kind of assuming that if you're a C programmer, you have at least some idea of what you know assembly code is, what a machine code is. Uh, and so I would suggest from whatever 
whatever starting point you have in terms of what you know about computers and assembly language, maybe x86 assembly language or whatever, um, try to try to make notes about what, if you've never seen a risk instruction set before, try to make notes about what things are different um, and try to kind of read it critically. Like you may, in certain cases, you like, I mean, you may note that there is no, that certain things come in signed and unsigned variants, but other things don't. And you might ask, why is that? Like, um, what's an example? There's one right here. SLT, set if less than. Oh, and uh, sorry, this is the immediate version, so that's not a good example. Let's uh, let's find the compare instructions right here. So most arithmetic, I think all the arithmetic instructions here don't have signed versus unsigned variants, but some of these things like the comparisons do. So try to think about if you haven't thought about it before, why why is that? Like why is why is this needed? But why why don't we need unsigned variants uh, versus signed variants of these arithmetic instructions? So try to think through that. Try to read it critically. If you run into things you can't answer yourself, make a note for it and ask it on the next stream, and I will answer them. Um, and uh, yeah, like throughout, they have some cool designer notes about rationale, uh, about why they did certain things the way they did, or kind of gotchas, um, which is really cool. And I wish more specifications did this. Um, of course, I would say the major distinguishing feature of RISC, uh, which like I said, goes back to John Cock at, at IBM, uh, in New York or New Jersey, can't remember where that research lab was, is the focus on load store architecture. So even on x86, which, you know, x86 is known for being a, a complex instruction set computer architecture, like a CISC, um, but compared to some things like VAX, uh, x86 is not that Baroque at all. Um, but the the case where x86 is definitely very risky, and I or CISCI, and I mean aside from just having a lot of instructions, but like even if you look at the instructions that people actually use in practice, rather than like old stuff like ASCII adjusted, or what is it, a binary coded decimal ASCII adjust or whatever, right? Like stuff that, which is the AA instruction, stuff that no one uses in practice. Even ignoring that sort of legacy, if you look at the instructions that people actually use, that you see like you know, if you uh, if you look at the disassembly for any C code, okay, that's not what I meant to do. This is going to be all over the place because I'm tired, but I hope there is some useful information here. Um, if you look at the disassembly from some random C code, you'll see these move instructions, which in this case is doing a load, um, but quite commonly, although maybe we have to look at more optimized code to really see it. Um, but you will see a lot of, I mean, here's an example, uh, like here. So this is doing a compare. Um, it's comparing uh, the contents of a certain four byte memory uh, value, uh, value in memory to the literal zero. So it's checking whether this thing is zero. JE means to jump if equal. And so this sets the condition flags uh, based on the comparison. Um, you'll note that this compare instruction directly has a memory operand. Uh, it's not comparing a register to zero. It's comparing the contents of memory directly to zero. So so even in these instructions that by themselves, if you just look at the instructions, x86 doesn't have that many instructions that you actually use uh, in normal code. But what they do have are a ton of addressing modes that are available in most instructions. So pretty much any instruction can have one of the operands, either the source or the destination, uh, directly reference memory as opposed to just an immediate value or, um, or a register. Uh, and that's one of the distinguishing features of RISCs over CISCs is that um, a RISC is a so-called load store architecture where really um, you know, the only instructions that do uh, memory loads and stores and this is I'm trying to think of their exceptions. I mean, I guess it depends. You can say that, you know, instruction fetch and stuff like that also implicitly loads memory, but at least for the data side of things, uh, it's only explicit load and store instructions that really load and store memory. You, you don't load and store memory as a side effect of some other instruction, like an addition. Um, so this is one of the major differences. If you look at um, all these instructions here, uh, the standard, 
if you will, the standard addressing mode or the standard operand mode in RISC is that you have registers as operands. So just registers as operands. And then in addition, usually there's a mode where you have uh, one register and one immediate. So an immediate is, is a constant value that's directly encoded in the instruction word. So it doesn't have to get fetched from memory or from another register. Um, and even the immediate mode uh, operands are generally quite limited in RISC, at least if you want to do them in a single instruction. So really, uh, RISC is focused on register to register uh, register to register instructions, and um, and especially for memory, those are outsourced to specific load store instructions rather than just being options you have available in every other instruction. So uh, so that's something you should you should keep keep in mind if you haven't seen it before. And so then you can see the specific load instructions they have. Um, they, um, let's see here, um, they come in, uh, let's see if I would put them, they have an overview here. All right. Well, anyway, there are these L and S instructions. W is for word, H is for half word, um, B is for byte. You can see they exist, uh, and again, this is something you should ask yourself if you haven't thought about it before. This is for the 32-bit instruction set. Um, so there's load word, which loads a, a full 32-bit value from memory into a register, so it doesn't have to fill in any other bits in that register. Um, but all these narrower loads um, have a U version, and the reason is um, if I load a 16-bit quantity from memory, and I have to fill a 32-bit register, I have to say what to do with the upper 16 bits that are not specified by the memory value. And so there are two options depending on whether you interpret the memory value as a signed or an unsigned operand. If it's an unsigned operand, you want to do zero extension. If it's, uh, if it's minus one, if you load minus one uh, as a single byte, for example, then it's FF, and the, the signed bit of that is one, and if you sign extend that, you now have FFFFFFFFF, right, like eight Fs in hex. And so that's the sort of thing that you do here. Um, and note that this is done as part of the load and store rather than being a standalone instruction. So there's no, you could imagine, I don't know, you could imagine only having a load unsigned instruction, which always zero extends, and then having a separate sign extension instruction, which is register to register, which uh, propagates the appropriate sign bit either in the eighth position or the 16th position into the higher bits. Uh, in a, as a register to register operand, but here they've uh, it's it's kind of traditional uh, to do it this way, even though in some sense this is you could argue maybe that it would be more in the risk spirit and the kind of register to register instruction spirit to split those out. But almost all the time when you need sign extension, um, it's when you're loading when you're doing these narrower loads, and so this is uh, the standard. And I'm sure this is, I mean, uh, this must be heavily backed by empirical studies, right? Like in terms of the instruction mixture of sign extensions is probably such that, like, I don't know, 95 or 99 percent of them are from loads. And so if you bundle them, it's more efficient. Um, it should be noted, though, that um, you can synthesize a sign extension. Maybe I'll give this away, but um, you can do sign extension like this in a register to register way. Um, for example, something like this. So eight big, eight, eight big sign extension, 16 bit sign extension. So you can do this stuff yourself if you wanted to as a register to register operand, but there's no dedicated instruction for it in this file. Here, this is arithmetic right shift, which smears the topmost bit um, as you shift it down. So anyway, um, yeah, there's some, some sort of lower level or uh, not lower level, but things that are related to control registers. Um, so this is more sort of the systems level stuff, which you may, you don't have to fully understand for now if you don't want to. Uh, this is not going to have a one-to-one -one correspondence to stuff you're most likely familiar with. But everything up here should correspond pretty well to things you know from C if you kind of know the mapping between C code and, say, x86 assembly code. Um, all right, I think that's pretty much all I want to ramble about that per se. Let me talk about what I plan to do in the coming weeks related to to this stuff more broadly. So on Friday, I plan to start um, working, well, I plan to do a more ordered walkthrough of different instructions in the base uh, integer ISA um, for RISC-V. And then I plan to start implementing an emulator 
including instruction decoding, decoding, all this stuff, like doing kind of a suite of tools that are designed to be used together, like emulator, assembler, disassembler, debugger. Um, and all of this is implemented in software. So it's not a hardware implementation. It's not writing hardware description language code uh, and running it on an FPGA. It's running it on a CPU, just like if you're running, you know, it's like you're running a JVM or you're running an emulated Commodore 64 on your uh, on your Intel processor. That's basically what we're going to be doing. But I want to say why we're doing it, because I've heard certain people say that I mentioned in the original vision document for Bitwise that we'll be doing a bunch of simulations and some of them seemed, I think for people who are not used to doing hardware, the, the, all the different simulations seemed like they might be redundant. Like, why can't you just do the hardware directly? Um, and there's various reasons for that. Um, one of them is that simu different simulations tend to have different, um, different uh, purposes. Like the kind of simulation we'll write will be uh, what's called an instruction set simulator. So it's not focusing on cycle level accuracy versus any specific microarchitecture or specific processor. It's focusing on implementing the ISA according to the specification. Um, and so if you have code, uh, if you have you know uh, a RISC-V machine code program that only relies on what the specification guarantees, it will run on our simulator. Um, so that's one kind of simulator. And that's generally the kind of simulator that you can make run the fastest because you don't have to emulate very specific timing quirks of you know pipelining or um or relative timing between you know like if you're emulating the commodore 64 you both have to emulate the 6502 cpu and that's one thing but you also have to make sure the timing between the, the cpu and the peripherals like the uh the the, the vic uh, graphics chip and the the you know the the io stuff you have to make sure that all of these things uh uh, don't just behave well in isolation, but also relative to all each other in terms of their relative timing and so on. And so that's it's a whole lot more complicated, and it's also much slower. It forces a implementation technique that's generally much slower to execute. Um, and so an ISA simulator, aside from being simpler, uh, is also much faster. And so um, it will be the easiest way, like if, for example, if we want to implement a new instruction, like we decide we want to implement a new instruction to accelerate a certain workload, it will always be easier to emulate to implement first in uh, in the instruction set simulator, um, and then we can actually write and test code there using that, uh, and then we can maybe move it to the hardware implementation, uh, and even the hardware implementation will run in a hardware simulator, and then we can test the hardware simulator versus the instruction set simulator so that the parts of the behavior that are supposed to be invariant, so not the specific timing, but the set of the, the, the ordered sequence of register states, for example, we can test that those will be coherent between the different simulations. So that's kind of one of the reasons that people like to have different simulations for different tiers of accuracy and performance is that, um, first off, they're appropriate narrowly for a specific purpose, but also you can test them against each other, uh, which will be very useful. And so you can make an instruction set simulator that's manifestly correct, or at least more manifestly correct than a hardware implementation. And then you can test the hardware implementation against the instruction set simulator by using that as a reference implementation. Uh, of course, you'll also want to do sort of torture tests that don't rely on golden box uh, or kind of golden model comparisons, uh, reference implementations. But uh, the idea of comparing two different simulators at different granularities or different approaches uh, and using them to sort of self-check against each other is a very powerful approach, and we'll be using that throughout. But um, step one is the instruction set simulator, which is what we'll be getting on Friday. Um, and um, so, so that's, I think, for the first week, we'll probably be working on those tools, the emulator, the assembler, the disassembler, the debugger, um, any other tools we need in order to do that. Like we'll probably do some basic peripherals, like we'll do a simulated UART, maybe a simulated VGA style graphics card. That stuff is so easy to implement in emulation. Once we have to do it in hardware, it's a little bit more hard, um, but, in it, but in this kind of simulation, it's almost trivial. You just write some software code, you hook it up with memory mapped IO and uh, you're, you're pretty much done. So we're going to be doing some of that stuff. And then having written those basic tools, we'll then actually write some risk assembly code programs. And we will start with the kind of snippets that I mentioned before, where we're almost just uh, doing Rosetta Stone, style, Rosetta Stone style translations from C code snippets to corresponding risk five snippets, just in order to get used to it. And then we'll start building up to some bigger programs. And one of the capstone programs I plan on writing from, uh, from scratch entirely by hand is um, a, a, a small fourth system. 
So a small, a small self-contained uh, fourth implementation, which is, I think, something you, well, I've written that on x86, and uh, I have a good idea of how much code it involves, and it's, it's a tractable amount. Um, and fourth by itself is quite a bit more usable than assembly language, so it will also be kind of a cool example of bootstrapping from a lower level abstraction with a minimal amount of code to a higher level of abstraction that's quite a bit more powerful. Uh, and also fourth is just cool. So uh, looking forward to sharing that with you. But that's some of the stuff I have planned for the next few weeks. Um, once that side of things is in good shape, we will then move on to the hardware design uh, part of the series. And once we move on to hardware design, that these tools that, that I just talked about will be used throughout. So anytime we're doing, we're assembling, assemb we're scribe assembly code in order to feed it to our uh, CPU, we will use the tools we wrote in the next few weeks. And of course, they'll be, be improved and extended over time, but that, that will be that set of tools. Um, so that's the plan for the next few weeks and beyond. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Again, I apologize for today being especially incoherent due to my sleep deprivation. But uh, I wanted to demo packages, and I promised a RISC-V intro, and so uh, this is not very good, and I want to do it more coherently and organized next time. But um, hopefully that at least gives you an idea of what's coming very soon. And I can't tell you guys how excited I am to begin on this part, because now that the compiler feels really good to use, um, this is you know, this is what I was looking forward to. Uh, and I think in particular showing, showing people how, like a lot of the skills we'd be applying are extensions of stuff we've already seen, like writing the assembler, guess what? It's a very simple compiler. It's much simpler than the stuff we did so far. So it'll be extremely easy. There's a few specific things you have to learn with assemblers, like uh, doing multi-pass stuff and whatnot. Um, and and uh, maybe relocations once we get to that point. But um, but I think you'll be surprised by how easy it is if you haven't seen it before. And you'll mostly just be applying skills we learned when we wrote the compiler. So very excited about that. Uh, hope everyone is excited too. And I will do Q&A now. Um, but otherwise, um, the big kickoff will be Friday. We'll, we'll begin some real coding related to RISC-V. So I'm very excited about that. All right. Um, someone's asking, will RISC-V and FPGA be limited to 32-bit due to gate count limitation? Is it plausible to do 64-bit? It's totally plausible to do 64-bit. It's uh, just not, I think, very f good use of resources, maybe. Um, for, um, for, for the, I mean, you'll see this once we do the chip design, but um, Scaling up a data path is usually pretty straightforward. Um, like to go from to go from 32-bit to 64-bit, you mostly have to make everything twice as wide. So the registers are twice as wide, so they double in size. Like the, the you know whatever memory resources you're using for the register file, they double in size. Um, the LU doubles in width, and um, that is mostly a linear increase as well. Maybe it's n log n, depending on the adder uh, uh, architecture. The multiplier scales up very poorly. So at least if you want to have the same implementation style, you can use a bit, you can use a bit serial multiplier, which will um, scale linearly in area, but will also take twice as long for twice as many bits. Um, but most of the rest of it just scales up by 2x plus uh, fudge factor. Um, so it's not that it's that bad, but it's just a big constant factor um, it, that we may not really have a use for. You know, if you think about the big reason to go to 64 bit is you want to have 64 bit addressing, and uh, we won't make use of that. Um, the, other, the other side of it is you have wider registers, uh, you have wider ALUs. Um, but if you're not doing a lot of 64-bit arithmetic, the LU stuff doesn't really help you. So it's just not really a win for us. So we will be doing 32-bit just because I don't see the point for us to do more. But it's not a fundamental. Um, it's not like it's 
completely untenable. Um, the, main, the main thing that scales poorly is if you want a fast multiplier, that thing scales quadratically with the number of bits. <clears throat> the rest of it is linear. Actually, not totally linear. It's n log n. Almost everything is n log n because all the control signals have to be fanned out. And to do optimal fan out requires a logarithmic kind of thing. Um, so it's probably n log n even for those. But the log n is for, for the control stuff. So it's asymptotically true, but maybe not in practice. So it's mostly linear scaling. So 64 bit is not some kind of major cost that we couldn't bear. It's just that it doesn't make sense for us. Um, Someone's asking, assembler first probably. Actually, my plan is to do the emulator, part the part of the emulator that directly executes a decoded instruction. And so, I mean, this will be a reference implementation. So it's not designed to be a fast emulator. It's designed to be a reference implementation. So you can basically imagine there's a fully decoded instruction, which is like, you know, I don't know, opcode or something. Um, you know, it's kind of a tag union like we've seen a million times before so it has all this stuff here uh, and then you you basically have I mean I don't know you can say like machine machine state or something or some stuff in here like uh, you have your um, your your regs um, and your uh, your PC you know, you have some stuff in here. Maybe we'll just call this machine. Um, and uh, oh, maybe I'll call this state actually. Um, it'll be something. I mean, this is schematic, but um, it'll be something like this, and then. This is a the opcode here is a fully decoded opcode. We don't have to do any further decoding of the fields and stuff. So this will basically just be a linear opcode. Um, and so you can imagine doing, uh, you know, op add, and um, it will be like, let's see. I'm too tired to write code. You know, it, I mean, this is very dumb. Uh, and here I'm also using a convention where, um, actually, this is not true because you have to. This is much slower. I mean, you'd want this to be fully inline, of course. Um, but conceptually, this is the sort of thing you should expect. Um, Something like this. Um, so yeah, so so this is the style of emulator I'm planning to start with, and, the, and the, where basically 
we uh, we have some standard uh, structure, which is a fully decoded instruction in a way that's easy to consume and analyze from a software perspective, like you can do a switch on the opcode and it will do a jump table. Um, and then you will have these things that basically specify operations on the on the state, on the architectural state, and uh, and so on. And um, um, the nice thing about this is you don't need an assembler to get started. You can just have like, you know, Right, you can do something like this. Um, this th this style doesn't. You have to combine this with something to handle control flow, where these things have to actually be decoded from memory. But the point is, you can actually get started with some of this instruction level stuff uh, before you have a full decoder and stuff. And then the idea is that um, this the, this kind of common data structure will be used by the reference emulator and the assembler and the disassembler, so that basically there will be an, an, an there will be a decoder, which is like, um, what is it? Um, you know, it would be something like this. And um, you will also have something like this. Um, and so the idea is you have these functions, and these can actually be used by all of the tools in the reference suite, like assembler, disassembler, uh, uh, emulator. And so uh, by using this approach, we can kind of bootstrap things without writing everything at once and kind of testing things and then expanding them and writing the rest of them and you know blah 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 so that's the style of reference implementation i'm planning on using this has performance issues if you want to do a high performance implementation but i think it's uh, ideally suited for doing reference implementations um, and it almost reads like pseudocode if you write it correctly and so that's the style that i'm planning on using for our reference suite of emulator assembler disassembler so uh, I'll, I'll show all this in detail on Friday, but uh, just as a tangent, that's kind of what I have in mind for the initial stuff. All right. Um, someone's asking, I understand the compile to C backend is never going away, but just hypothetically, if it wasn't a constraint, what would you change, add about ION while staying in the same general design space? Um, one thing I would probably do would be to add uh, inline assembly, even for host side stuff. So my plan currently is to add inline assembly, but only for risk five, since this is, I mean, for me, you know, if you're doing low level firmware programming or uh, kernel programming, you'll want inline assembly sometimes. And so it'll be useful there. And also just for performance, of course, as always. Especially given that our compiler won't be very good at code generation on Risk Five, it won't be a highly optimizing compiler. Inline assembly can come in handy, um, so it would be nice to have that for x86 too. Actually, uh, given you know if I did I didn't have that constraint, but the problem of course is that um, inline assembly on in C is a totally endangered species and it's also highly non-portable. Even if the underlying instruction set architecture like x86 is the same. Um, they no longer support inline assembly in the 64-bit version of Visual C++. And uh, the, also the inline assembly notation traditionally used by GCC and Plang is totally different. And I also think totally crap um, with the clobber lists and all that stuff. So I, I mean, it's a personal opinion. So I mean, like in theory, you could do some crazy thing where you synthesize to different 
you know, you if def everything depending on whether you're targeting one or the other, but even that wouldn't work nicely on um, on MSVC because it straight up doesn't support inline assembly in 64-bit mode. So that's probably the biggest thing that would be nearly impossible to support without um, going to a native backend. But I wouldn't want to do it. Like as an engineering trade-off, it would be insane. Um, like what the, the amount of leverage we're getting from our current approach uh, would literally take man years of effort to replicate by hand, and it would it would still probably like that would give us some narrow advantages in some areas while giving us uh, I would say almost entirely disadvantages in other areas. Like it would be nice to have a much faster end-to-end -end compilation pipeline, um, but with some of the tree shaking stuff we're doing, I think that will be sufficient for even very large programs to compile instantaneously. I think so. Anyway. Um, there are some things I would probably change, but not as many as you might think, not given the design space we're in. Um, the stuff where I would want these features is for RISC-V, and for RISC-V, we control the entire pipeline, and so we will do those things that I can't do on the host for practical reasons, but a uh, good question. All right. Um, so yeah, um, today was a little bit off in terms of mental acuity and organization, but um, hopefully people got a little bit excited and hopefully people enjoyed the package demo, which I am pretty happy with how that turned out and I'm looking forward to next steps. So uh, see everyone on Friday. I hope if you're excited, you'll read through those only 25 pages of the chapter on RV32i in the instruction set manual. And like I said, try to read it actively, compare it to what you know, ask questions about what it differs and if it's lacking certain things or seemingly lacking certain things, um, how can you do things that, uh, how can you still do things uh, maybe in more indirectly in RISC-V that you might be used to doing more directly on, on x86 and so on. Like, uh, you know, like, and maybe if, if you don't, <laughs> in a specific thing, if you don't understand how this sign extension trick works, uh, try to work through it on paper, but that's the sort of thing that, um, you know, if you're on x86, you would just do like move, move Vara, you know, what can you do? You could do like uh, EAX, AX, I guess would be a 16-bit to or AL, I think, right? Would it be this? Sign extend the low byte into the high byte, into the word. Like, so you could do this sort of thing directly on x86, but on other processors, you have to synthesize the sign extension yourself using, you know, two shifts, one normal left shift and then one one right arithmetic shift. Anyway, so try to work through those cases and, and kind of ask yourself questions and build up a list of unanswered questions and bring them to the next stream, and I will try to answer them as best I can. So anyway, that's it for today. Uh, see everyone next time. Hope everyone is excited to start with the hardware stuff.